In today's video, we're going to be talking all about the construction submittal process. That's right. So let's go. So in construction management, there's actually a process that takes place prior to the fabrication and the installation of material on a job site where the contractor submits documents to the architect or engineer of record per the specification requirements, ranging from product data, material samples, shop drawings, and much more. These are referred to as submittals, and they will be found within different divisions of the specification sections. These documents are submitted so that the architect and engineer can verify as sort of a back check that the contractor is going to meet the intent of the plans and specs. So submittals are not contract documents, and although they provide intent, the installing contractor still needs to follow the plans and specifications to meet their contract requirements. Submittals are also not only material specific, they can include as built or record document requirements, attic stock requirements or material you hand over at the end of the job, calculations, mixed designs, operation and maintenance instructions that'll help the owner and their facilities team operate the building, certain test reports throughout the project and warranties. So majority of smaller to medium sized construction projects don't even have this submittal process. You usually just sign a contract, go get the materials and start building. This is usually based on the contract requirements and the type of project. So this is not applicable to everyone. So some of the statements I make in this video, as with all my videos, it all comes down to the type of contract you have, the type of project you have, because nothing in construction is the same. That being said, those of you who are working in commercial construction or soon to be working in commercial construction, you'll likely be part of the submittal process process in one way or another. So let's talk briefly about the life cycle of construction submittals using the example of a general contractor acting as a CM or a construction manager under a design bid build GMP guaranteed maximum price contract. I've got a video on the top 80 construction terms I use on a day to day basis on my channel. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at that yet, Hit that subscribe button below and watch that video at a later date. It'll help you with some of the terms I use throughout my videos. So let's get back to the scenario I just outlined. The construction manager has been awarded the project by the owner and can now proceed with construction coordination. The owner has a separate contract with the architect and engineer firm. The job has just started and the CM has issued contracts to all the subcontractors for their applicable scope. The CM to subcontractor language will usually outline and define which specification sections the subcontractor is responsible for, which means the subcontractor is to fulfill and complete all the requirements of those specification sections. This is also referred to as their scope of work. So as I mentioned earlier, the required submittals that that subcontractor is now responsible for based on these contracts are located within each specification section under their scope of work. So start off by reading the submittal procedures specification section. This should have defined terminology that you'll see throughout the spec book. This could include action submittals versus information submittals. Action submittals being submittals that you have to provide to the architect and engineer for their review versus information submittals that are just submitted for record or for the owner at the end of the project. So I quickly want to recap the purpose of the submittal process one more time before we move on. So buildings can be extremely complex and there could be thousands of vendors selling materials within the construction industry for materials used on your project. Each of those vendors may have hundreds of options. For example, how many different types of flooring are there? Well, you don't just get to install whatever flooring you want. You got to follow what the owner has required in these specifications. So we're going to use the submittal process to get this information conveyed to the architect as a back check. So again, you are ordering the correct material so it is installed correctly on the job. This prevents risk from the contractor installing it, the architect, and then at the end of the day, the owner gets what they want. So if you're the installing contractor, you're at risk if you release an order of material prior to getting approval on your submittals. Let's say the submittal required a certain color and material and you went and ordered it just based on an assumption. While the architect didn't have the chance to select the color, or the owner didn't have the chance to select the color, and now you've got sunk costs because you've got the wrong material and the wrong color on the job site. So the submittal specification section may state that the construction manager or general contractor is required to provide a submittal log at the beginning of the project within a certain time frame. The submittal log is a summary of all the submittals that the contractor is going to provide, including the subcontractors. It is usually the task of a project engineer or somebody on the construction manager's team to pull this information together out of the spec sections manually or using some variation of technology and provide this list to the architect and engineer that will be receiving these submittals. 
Each submittal on the log will have its own submittal number. This submittal number comes from the specification section that that submittal was pulled out of. It'll also have a revision number and a title. This is a means to keep track of all these submittals as they can potentially be transferred through a number of hands throughout the process. For example, an installing and finishing concrete subcontractor needs to order concrete mix through a concrete supplier. Well, the specification section may require a mix design submittal to be submitted to the structural engineer. So the subcontractor gets the mix design submittal from the concrete supplier who then submits it to the construction manager or general contractor who then submits it to the structural engineer. The structural engineer reviews the submittal, can either approve it or reject it, and then it goes back to the construction manager or general contractor, then it goes back to the installing concrete finisher, and then it goes back to the concrete supplier. So as you can see, it trades hands a bunch of times. So as these submittals are trading hands, there's usually a requirement to stamp them, which is just putting your approval or your seal on the document saying that you reviewed it. This is usually a requirement of the specifications and an architect or an engineer can reject it if they don't see an approval or a review stamp from the construction manager or the general contractor. So I always like to talk about risk because project management is really just managing risk. So where can risk be introduced into this submittal process? Well, it's usually schedule related. So the submittal specification section should outline the terms of reviewing submittals and returning them from the contractor, architect, and engineer. Why would this be important? Well, let's say you're ordering a large piece of equipment that takes 60 days to arrive from the manufacturer after the time of release. As an example, let's assume that the submittal specification section allows for a 10-day review period after the contractor submits it to the architect or engineer. So if it takes 10 days for the submittal review process, 60 days to deliver a piece of equipment, and let's say it takes five days on the front end to prepare that submittal, well, that's 75 days or two and a half months. So let's assume in this example that the contract schedule requires the equipment to be on site next month. This contractor has two options at this point. Option one is to release the material at risk without following through on the contractual submittal process, which is highly discouraged as there can be huge cost impacts if the equipment shows up incorrectly. Option two is to follow the submittal process and work with the general contractor or construction manager to see what impacts there might be from the equipment showing up late. Either way, this is a lose-lose situation for the subcontractor as there are likely monetary impacts, sometimes in the form of liquidated damages for the equipment showing up later than the contract schedule calls for. Another scenario, let's say the contractor submitted the submittals right on time to get the delivery a day before it's needed per the contract schedule. But in this scenario, let's say the construction manager, general contractor, or architect and engineer took 30 days to review instead of their allotted contractual 10 days days per the specifications. Well, this is the flip side where the installing contractor followed the correct steps, but the material is now going to show up late because of the review process not being within their allotted time. Material lead times can be an aspect that is constantly fluctuating because of the current construction industry supply chain, which is why managing material deliveries can be a time-consuming task. I'll go in depth in this in an upcoming scheduling video, but material lead times play a huge part in building a successful schedule. If your project is only six months long, but the material lead time is seven to eight months, you've already set yourself up for failure from the beginning. This is why on the front end, as a good construction manager, project manager, or general General contractor, you want to engage your material vendors to make sure that you understand current lead times within the volatile market. If you're managing multiple subcontractors or if you're a subcontractor dealing with multiple material supply vendors, you should constantly be looking at the construction contract schedule for your mobilization date. This is the date that you're set to be on site to start your scope of work. You take this mobilization date and you work backwards with all known lead times, review periods, etc., so that you can effectively get your material onto the site when it needs to be there. So you read your specifications section first and understand all these requirements, the last thing before looking at some specific submittal examples is just knowing that there's usually some sort of software to transfer these submittals back and forth between the contractor to another contractor to the architect engineer, etc. Okay, so using the mixed design submittal example, I'm going to start off with the cast in place concrete spec section, which I'm going to navigate to in the spec book. I'm going to read the whole specification section first, then find the submittal subsection, which, as you can see, requires more than just a mixed design submittal. I'm going to bump this over to the left side for reference, and then I'm going to pull up the submittal 
that the concrete supplier prepared for me. The concrete supplier should have access to this spec book and the drawing so they can prepare the submittal accurately and ultimately prepare the order correctly. I've got the submittal pulled up on the right side of the screen. So the submittal process starts and those responsible for reviewing this submittal should be cross-referencing between the specifications, the drawings, and the submittal to make sure that everything is aligned and accurate. This is also how the architect and engineer will review the submittal prior to approving or rejecting it. So let's assume everything is accurate within the submittal. We attach a transmittal page, which is just a cover page recapping the information and the comments about the review. The contractor combines these documents and forwards it along to the design team. If the design team approves it, you can release the material. If they reject it, you start this submittal process over from the beginning. This happens for every action submittal in the specification sections, which can be hundreds on a larger project. This all gets tracked on that submittal log I showed you earlier, which is constantly relating back to the master schedule to ensure material orders are getting pushed through timely and ultimately making it to the site on time. And the last item I'll note is that there's sometimes an option if a material happens to be discontinued or if the contractor has a better alternate that they want to suggest, it's called a substitution. There's generally a form that you have to fill out, but a note of caution is that not all materials are compatible, so you'll have to do your homework to ensure that the material compatibility is not going to create an issue down the road after you install it. So this video covers the general submittal process, but in some future videos, I'll go further in depth and review various submittal examples such as product data, how to coordinate shop drawings amongst different trades, what delegated design means, and a little further insight into how I track this all in relation to the overall schedule. So I'm hoping you picked up some new information today about the submittal process within the construction industry and how it relates to material showing up on your actual job site. If you've got any specific requests on topics you'd like me to cover in the future, feel free to drop a comment below. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. As always, bye for now. now.